just for the benefit of the recorder. So if you're adding an object to the array or an array list, like this, you create a point and you add it and then you change its values and you add it again, you've actually changed the values also for that one because they are the same reference. It's the same object. It's just like you have a list, but on both of them they say Jeff, right, same person. Okay, so I want to talk about inheritance. I want to talk about interfaces again. I also want to go eyeball the homework itself, the homework assignments, excuse me. And I really don't know how they all wound up being set due. I guess like I made one do three weeks in advance, and one do two weeks in advance, and one do one week in advance, or something. So I've spaced them back out. That also gives people a little bit of extra time to work on them. So we had should just be in student mode, pop up faster. Oh, and see, my, my brain is flipping around. I added new, two new projects. Really want y'all to do projects, which is why I've offered y'all the ability to skip the final if you, if you do a, a good job on the project. Okay, so two new ones. Mastermind. Y'all may have played the game Mastermind when you were a kid. Look like this. The way it works <clears throat> is... Your opponent, i.e. the computer, the program, picks, you know, a code. And they don't all have to be separate colors. They could be, you know, duplicate colors, red, red, green, green, or, you know, all reds or whatever. And then the uh, person takes turns, or not turns, keeps trying to solve it. And they get feedback from the code maker in the form of these little tabs over here. White tabs mean you have the right color, but it's in the wrong place. Black tabs mean that not only do you have the right color, but it's in the right place. So, for example, by the time, let's look at this one right here. Red, blue, green, red. That's not in the right place, but there is a red, so that's worth a white tab. There's not any blue, so that's worth nothing. There is a green, but it's in the wrong place, so that's worth another white tab. And then there's a red, but we've already used up that one red, so that's worth nothing. So we have two white tabs. And then on their next guess, they, they got a couple of them right, right? They got the black one in the right place, they got the red one in the right place, so those are worth two black tabs, pegs, and then those, these two are completely wrong. So, Mastermind's kind of fun. I wrote the program, and it actually took me longer than, uh, than I thought it would kind of broke my brain a little bit. I thought this was an easy programming problem. I meant for it to be like the easy project out of the group. Maybe it is, and my brain just broke a little bit, but uh, I thought it was a fun one. So here's my example of it. I'm going to, yeah, let's play Mastermind. I'm thinking of a secret code that's four digits long, where each digit is between one and five. Now, if you wanted to be awesome, you'd make it so that it was of any length, right? You ask the user, you know, five, six pegs, three, one. <laughs> Remember, a digit is correct if the digit is in the correct place. A digit is misplaced if it's in the code but not in the correct place. So, the computer picks a code, 5432. Be far better if it was random. Take your guess. One, two, three, four. Well, one, two, three, four. Five, four, three, two. The threes are in the right place, so that's a correct one. Ignoring the threes, we have a 1, which is totally wrong. We have a 2, which is right but in the wrong place. And we have a 4, which is right but in the wrong place. So we have 1 correct and 2 misplaced. So out of frustration, we guess all 1s. And we get told, nope, none of them were correct. You could use that technique to find out, right, you know, which numbers were in it. You could guess all 2s. You could guess all 3s. You could guess all 4s. You might find out that, you know, there were two 2s or whatever. Then take your guess, 2112. See the note about this guess. One is correct. There are no misplaced. So why is one correct? Well, that one and that one hook up. But of the rest, yeah, there's another two here. And you may think that, well, it's misplaced. But no, we've already crossed these off because they matched. And so there's no other twos in it. And of course, there's no ones. So that's a correct and a misplaced. So I put a whole, I mean, since I took the time to write the program, I went ahead and put, put you know, a, a transcript of it. 
Let's play. They guess all fives. Yeah, there, there's one correct. They guess all fours. Yep, one correct. Threes, one correct. Twos, correct. Ones, nope. All righty, and then they start taking stabs at it. Five, five, four, four. Four, four, five, five. Five, four, four, three. Then they do the H command. I tacked that on. You wouldn't have to add a history command, but I thought it was cool because, you know, this is kind of hard to read, but if it dumps it out like this, it's much easier to read. Figure out, you know, and then by a miracle, we got it now correct on the next one. I thought that was fun. I think that's a pretty neat assignment. The next one, Hangman. This is probably the easiest assignment of all. Not that I want you to necessarily just pick an easy project, but, you know, I want you to choose one to the, uh, to the level that you want. You know how to play Hangman, right? Let's play Hangman. I'm thinking of a word. It's seven letters long. It's up to you to decide how the program chooses a word. Maybe you're going to put an array of words in there and then pick one randomly, right? You might hard code a, you know, just one word in there during your test process at first and then make it pick randomly. You know, if you wanted to, you could download, you know, a list, a huge list of words from the internet, read them all in. We haven't talked about file I.O. I was hoping to do that today. You know, anyways, make it pick a word. Even if you turned in one that, you know, had only one word programmed into it, you know, yeah, that would prove that you figured out how to do it. But, it, you know, make an array of words or something, pick one. So guess a letter. Well, the word that we're looking for is hangman, right? Okay, so... There were two A's. Guess another letter. Nope, B. Okay, now we only have seven more mistakes we can make. Guess another letter, C. Now you don't have to draw a picture of a guy being hung, right? You know, <laughs> that's not the point. Then they guess G. All righty, that's cool. Guess an N. All right, that's cool. We've almost got it fixed. But for some reason, we guess a wrong one. You can only make five mistakes. Then we guess another wrong one. Only make four mistakes. Guess an H? Well, come on, we're getting pretty close. Guess an M? We got it. You've won. Play again, yes, no. Does that make sense? All right. I don't have a preference as to which one you ought to do. Just, just pick one. All right. Back to interfaces. I wanted to look at the homework assignment for... Lock and cube. All right, I don't know why I just jumped in here with this chart without explaining what it's supposed to do. But we're going to implement a block class as shown. Add getters and setters. Then write a cube class which extends the block class. It doesn't add any instance variables. Right? Because our block already has a height, width, and a depth. But what's the difference between a block and a cube? A cube, all three of these are the same. So after you've implemented your block class, then do a cube class that extends the block. And all it has to have in it is a separate constructor, which would set height, width, and depth all to the same value. And then another one, a cone and a sphere assignment. So note that these do not overlap. You don't need to modify the classes in part A to do the separate things in part B. They can be completely different projects or, or the same project. So we're going to have three classes, shape, cone, and sphere, and a client class. So we have a shape class. The shape class has two types. We could even declare it as an abstract class if you wanted to go like that doesn't matter. If you make it an abstract class, you wouldn't put a body in it. I don't want to confuse the, uh, the, uh, the explanation. So the shape class has two members. All they do is return zero because the shape has no information about it. So create the super class. That just means a class with no extends word. The method should just return zero because you will override them in the subclasses. So make a shape called cone. A cone has a perfect, I mean, you know, not a weird shaped cone. A geometric cone has a height and a radius. 
And yeah, you ought to be cool and put constructors and stuff like that, but I don't list, you know, them. You could get away with not adding the, the constructors and the getters and the setters, but whatever. The class will override the get volume and the get surface area. We've been talking about overrides for a long time, like overriding the two string method. So get volume is actually going to return the real volume based on the height and the radius. And so we'll get surface area. And you can Google those formulas or if you get stuck. Also, shear, ex shear? sphere extent, extent shape. It only has one member variable. It still needs a get volume and a get surface area that override the originals. So your client's main should create a sphere and a cube, and then have your client print out the surface area and volume of each shape. You want to be more awesome, create a whole bunch of them, stick them in an array list, and then process them with an array list. That's what I should have had required you to do. You know, create multiples of each kind, put them in an array list, and then later have a for loop that runs through the radius, printing them all out. I hope that makes sense. Because if you do something like this, class fun, you know, and you give it a member, a method, and all it does is return, you know, a zero. And then later you do class, you know, fun two that extends fun, and it overrides that, at override. And get num, and it returns a hundred. And then you do. I'm going to call this something else other than fun to make it dramatically different. Joy. And then you make another class. What's another kind of fun? Joy. Happiness. Whatever. That also extends fun. Don't make it extend joy. There's no reason to do that. Just have them both extend fun. And it's override. Does something else, it returns. I think I actually need to uh, modify that assignment so that I do you do add them to an array list. Just to get just to annoy you, since you were having fun with the array list. You'll be happy. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Okay, so then in your main, wherever, write class app, public static void main. I know I'm skipping stuff, but you know what we're doing. We're going to create, you know, joy equals new joy. We would have, there's no data to set, right? So who cares? But I forgot to give it a variable. Then we're going to do joy2, and then we're going to put happiness1, and we're going to do happiness h2. We're going to add them all to an array list. But what does our array list have to be in order to accept both data types? I'm not going to make an array list of joy and an array list of happiness. They need to be the root class. If you really wanted to be weird, you could make the them, uh, you know, the textbook showed this at one point. Yeah, that's a little bit too vague. Just make them do your super class, which is fun. Is it, you know, fun list is equal to new array list, right? And then add our guys to it. Fun list dot add, joy one, do the same thing, joy two, happiness one, happiness two. Then make a for list that calls get num. I don't you know, maybe it's totaling them or whatever, you know. And total is equal to zero, or, or we print it out, who knows. So for every, for every, fun in the fun list
we add that total to the total plus equals fund dot get num. Right? And so when it was done, what would it do? Well, the happiness is return 100. The fund, the, uh, excuse me, joys return 100, happiness is return 200. So that would add up 100, 100 plus 200 plus 200. Now that's simpler than our problem about the shapes, you know, the cones and stuff like that. But does that make sense? Trying to look in the eyes of the people who take so many questions about them. Are, are we better or do we need to go totally back into inheritance? It's okay to say, yeah, we need to go totally back into inheritance. Wave your hand all the way if you want to do inheritance. Halfway if you kind of wish we had more. None. Okay. Everybody's giving me <laughs> blank looks. <laughs> I don't know what to do with blank looks. All right. So that's the inheritance problem. An abstract class is just, not that the assignments ask for an ab abstract class, it's just one that looks like this. You don't even provide a body for it. Why do you do that? It forces the class that extends it to implement that. So we're still guaranteeing that every object that extends fun has a get num. We just don't have a default you know, method for it. We didn't bother writing one. So that, that would have been the correct way to do it. I could modify the assignment to specify that it was an abstract, but hopefully you understand that there's not a whole bunch of difference between doing this with the return zero and doing this. The only difference is, is that if it's abstract, you just cannot instantiate a copy of it. How could it? It doesn't know what the methods are, right? So if I went down here and I tried to make a fun, you know, fun F1 is equal to new fun, like that. I can't do that because fun is an abstract class. But I can create any instances of the classes that inherit from it. They're not abstract. So all that would work. We still good. I see some, some nods. Hope we're good. All right. So that is an inherited class. An interface is like an abstract class, except you're, the difference, well, a class can only inherit, can only extend from one superclass in this language, unlike C++. So we couldn't make two superclasses and then have an object that is both of them. Right, I'm going to make an animal superclass, and then I'm going to make a, you know, a plant superclass, and then I'm going to have an object that is both animal and plant. Can't do that. If you need to inherit from more than one class, instead you use interfaces. And an interface is a class. It's like an abstract class. So... But you define it with the word interface. And we're going to say that boats have a method called float. All it prints is I'm floating. And I ought to be making, I'll type this, but you know. C out, I'm doing C++, system.out.println, you know, I am floating. Then you make another interface. Why did I call it multiple boats? There we go. Interface. I think I'm, I may be goofing here. I'd better type this into NetBeans before I totally botch it. I did botch it because the methods in an, in an interface need to be abstract. So that would not work. You just say float, but you don't give a body for it. Meanwhile, planes have a different interface that you're going to have to implement. Planes fly. 
And then we have a land vehicle, car, whatever. And cars drive. So let's make a project that has those three interfaces tucked away in it. And by the, the, by the way, the strongest reason for putting every class in its own file is so that you could bring that class in from another project, right? You could import that project and then be able to use that class. Whereas if you put multiple classes in the same files, it's only the main class in that file that you would be able to access by importing it. Hope that kind of makes sense. All righty, so I already typed this stuff, but I'm going to have to give you time to type it. Just pop that stuff in above. Oh, I'm getting errors. What do you know? Oh, for Pete's sake. What's wrong with calling it float? It's a keyword. It's a data type. Okay, so rather than flow, what does a boat do? Bob in the lake. Yeah. Oh, gosh. What was yours? Sail. Sail. Yeah, boats sail while planes fly and cars drive. So get those three interfaces going. And then we're going to make... I'm going to shorten them way dramatically in a way that you should not do in production code. So I'm going to make a boat. Class Titanic implements the boat class which means that it has to have a sail method. That's what this error is. It's saying Titanic is not abstract and does not override abstract method. Yeah, you can get away with not implementing abstract methods by making the class that is implementing it also abstract, but we're not going to do that. Okay, so void sail, and what does it do? It prints out that it's sailing. System.out.println. I am sailing. I put my semicolon in the wrong place. It's a problem with trying to write a condensed syntax like this. And I'm still getting an error. All right. Why it's yelling at me is because it. I did not specify data types. If these are public, then that one should be public. So, I should go and insert the word public. I don't know why I thought I could get away with not specifying access types. And of course that requires me to put the word public here. And I should also implement a plane in a car the same way. I may skip one, but we're going to make something that's both a boat and a car. So, class Yugos. Implement car. And so it needs the method drive. Public void drive. I should have just copied and pasted this from the above one, but System.out.println, vroom, vroom. Seem to be getting an error here. Open brace expected. Oh, because I misspelled implements. Implements. And there are certainly vehicles that both float and run on wheels. 
let's say that Teslas are so dang cool that they can float. So, class Tesla implements both boat and car. And in the interest of time, I'm going to copy both of these methods and paste them into Tesla. I'm getting little warnings here. Oh, it's wanting me to add the at override annotation to everything. And hopefully we are all have gotten far enough in this that we know that I can move these lines up to the top. Just doing that to get it all in the same line. Could I put at override on the same without treat it like it was a, a keyword like that? Yeah, sure can. Okay. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. Right? I could have gotten rid of plane because I didn't create one that was just a plane. I'm going to delete plane just for the purposes of this example. So, you have something that is both a boat and a car. You also have something that is only a car. You also have something that is only a boat. So, you kind of do have to test the, uh, the type of the object to see whether it's, a, whether it's a boat or a car. Because you can't call dot drive on a boat and you can't call dot sail on a car but you can call both on this guy. So we're going to write a method called move. And what the move method does is if it's a boat, it calls dot sail. If it's a car, it calls dot drive. And if it happens to be both, it winds up calling both of them. So up here, up above main, public static void main, nope, main, um, move, travel, I like travel, okay. And it's going to take not a Tesla Yugo or Titanic, I guess I'm just going to make it take, take an object because I forgot to create a superclass for all these guys. Maybe I should have ought to. That might not have been a bad idea, but I didn't. And what I mean is, is that since these don't all inherit from the same class, I can't limit. Eh. Maybe we'll go back and fix that. But anyways, travel is going to take an object. But we can't just call dot sail if we don't know that it's a boat. So if O instance of car. And let me guess, it's not instance of. Okay, what is it? All right. There we go. Alrighty, so if it's a car, we're going to call o.drive, because that's what cars do. I'm going to remove my braces. We understand that they're... But I can't really do that. I'm going to wind up putting my braces there. Because a car, because an object doesn't have a dot .drive method, right? And so it cannot hook up this object to the car's dot .drive method. I'm going to have to cast it. To a car. That is a nice looking way of doing it and there's a nasty looking way of doing it. The nice looking way of doing it is to actually do the cast and then the call in two separate lines. So car C is equal to the car version of that object. We cast that object to a car and then we do that. But you could do it in one fell swoop. 
So we're going to do that for the other version. We're going to do that for the plain one. This is almost too clever by half, but if O instance of boat, then we're going to say, all right, you're a boat. Oh, you're a boat, and so I know that I can call sail. I don't think I can get away with taking away these parents there. Yep, I was correct in that. All right. Just depends on which way you like to do it. That's a little bit more instantly readable, perhaps, after you get used to looking at it. They're doing the same thing, though, right? We had to turn it into the type. We had to get a reference to it in the form of a car before we could invoke that method. Otherwise, the compiler would not know how to link to the drive method because it doesn't know that it has a drive method. Yeah, it knows it's an instance of the car, but an object itself does not have a drive method. We could... Uh, if I had made another class for them all to extend, I wouldn't have had to make it as generic as object O. Right. I could have just called it vehicle. Right. Vehicle V. That wouldn't have given us any other advantages, but it would have made this <coughs> a little bit better. A little more specific. And why might you want that? You might have to overload this method with another one that took a different category of things. Okay, I hope those concepts are okay. hope those concepts, they both implement the kind of idea of an is a. Remember, comp um, composition is has a. I has a name. I has a age. <laughs> I know it's silly for me to say it that way, but I is a human. I is a teacher, right? I is an Oklahoman. So, you know, inheritance does the is a relationships. While composition, the data that it contains, are has a relationships. Now the difference, why you would use an interface, is if you want to make something that inherits from more than one object. Right? We have something that can be a car, or it can be a boat, or it can even be both. Now if we implemented a car superclass and a boat superclass, then something could only be one or the other. Not both. So if we go and we look at that homework over interfaces, we're going to create two interfaces, one called solid and one called shape. A solid is a 3D object, and a shape is a 2D object. By the way, I've decided to change the shapes because I'm really tired of doing circles and spheres and things like that. But the, I'll give you the equations for them. So, the solid interface should have a get volume method. A shape should have a get surface area method. Honestly, they should both have get surface areas. But the way you're going to do that is that everything that has a surface area... Okay, anyways... Create a circle class. I've decided to change this to triangle, just for funsies. That implements shape. It will need a member variable for the edge length, and it must override the get surface area method. And the formula for... I'll paste it in, because I want to paste it in as a picture. Maybe I can get it right now. No, I'll, I'll paste it in, um, but I'll show you the formula for a triangle. Surface area of perfect triangle. Those are called equilateral triangles, I believe. It's not called. I'll work back on that. And then another one called tetrahedron. Y'all know what a tetrahedron is? Some of y'all will. That implements both solid and shape. A tetrahedron is a shape that's composed of all triangles. Now there's a couple of different shapes. Platonic solids that are made out of all solid, all triangles. 
One is the eight-sided figure, one is a 20-sided figure, but the simplest one is the tetrahedron. The tetrahedron looks like that, right? Looks like a pyramid, but it's only got three upward-facing sides rather than a square base. All right, and so that's the equation for the surface area of a tetrahedron. So it must override the surface area method. Okay, I'll go back and fix that as well. It must override the get volume because it's both a shape and a solid, right? So, your client needs a static method print data. Print data should accept an object just like our, uh, our travel method did. Void print data object. Oh, print data should print the volume of the object if it has volume. It should print the area of the object if it has area. So I already gave you the sample. So main should create both several triangles and tetrahedrons. It should then call print data on each object and print the results, the area, the volume, or both for that object. For extra credit, both triangle and tetrahedron need equals and two string. I know you were digging into this and it wasn't making sense. Is it making more sense now? Everybody agree? Yeah. It was kind of confusing. I didn't really understand. We had it as a sphere, as a second. What and why we would need a variable edge length. They both will need an edge length now that they're triangles and tetrahedrons. They both needed a radius when they were spheres and uh, circles. However, if they had all inherited from a, excuse me, if they had all extended a round object, that, that would be worth showing. So say we had a uh, class round object, round shape, something like that. And all it does is have a radius. Then you could make a class circle that extends round object. Maybe it'd have a constructor that sets the radius, right? Public circle, you know, double radius that accepts, you know, that sets this dot radius equal to radius. But it doesn't have to declare the radius itself because we know that all round objects have them. And then another one, class sphere. It's also a round object. And so it would also need a radius. Excuse me, it would also need a constructor. Now we want to do that kind of functionality that our uh, assignment was asking for. Right, so interface, you know, shape, a 2D shape. We know that it's going to have a get surface area method. And anything that is a solid that has volume is going to have a get volume method. Okay, so a circle is only one thing. It implements the shape. A sphere is both. It implements shape and solid. And I ought to be making everything uppercase, right?
So you would have to do at override on the, uh, you know, get surface area method. And this one, since it's a shape, would have that method as well, but it would also have the other method, get volume. I'll correct the syntax a little bit. Public, double, you know, get surface area. It would have to have some good stuff in it. It'd have to actually be an implementation. Public, double, get surface area, and public, double, get volume. sense okay so each one of these is going to have to have an edge length in our uh... for those as well if you think about it we'd probably see this when we google up the formulas but a tetrahedron is just four triangles, right? So once you figure out the uh, how to calculate the egg, uh, the uh, edge length of a triangle, excuse me, the surface, the area of a triangle, you could just say four times that, and that would be the area of the tetrahedron. But you know, I'll provide the methods, the uh, formulas. I shouldn't. I should make you sweat, but nah, y'all sweated enough so far. All right, we pretty good on that. We think we can go on. Okay, so yo prof add formulas. All right, what I wanted to do is to talk about exceptions. And we may as well do this in code. I'm not sure I ever ran this to make sure it worked. Did it work for any of y'all? If y'all build it and run it, everybody who typed it. Clean and rebuild. Run it. All right, it actually ran that time right. Didn't do anything. Why is that? I never created any of these objects. Herp a derp. Okay, so boat B1 is equal to new boat. Boat B2 is equal to new boat. Tesla T1 is equal to new Tesla. Why am I getting an error here? Because boat is abstract. Okay, so these are supposed to be Titanics. Titanic B1 is equal to new Titanic. Why is that? Because you can't implement, you can't instantiate an interface. And then Titanic B2 is equal to new Titanic. And then what? Did we? And Yugo. We had some Yugos as well. So Yugo Y1 is equal to new Yugo. We could add them all to an array list, but I think I'm just going to call travel on each one. Travel on B1, travel on B2, travel on my Tesla, travel on my Yugo. Now we're going to have a kind of a, a bunch of 
Once we run it, we're not going to be super happy with our output because we're not going to know which output goes with which vehicle, right? But let's at least make sure that this works before we tidy it up. So I am sailing. That's the Titanic. I am sailing. That's the Titanic. The Tesla, on the other hand, can both drive and sail. And the Yugo can drive. Now we could give these objects names or print some other kind of message to indicate, you know, what kind of objects they were. So let's go do that. Nah, nah, it, it wouldn't be any clearer. We'd have to just like print, you know, stick a print message here saying what which object it was. I think this is pretty clear. I hope that's pretty clear. Okay. So exception handling. You know, we've written a whole bunch of programs that will crash if we do the wrong thing. Right? The dumbest example is dividing by zero. Right? Int x is equal to two, int y is equal to one, no, zero. Int z, I'm going to put this on a separate line. Z is equal to x divided by y. And then system dot out dot print line z. When we run it, guess what it's going to do? It's going to blow up. And you can get runtime exceptions for any number of things. You try to write past the end of the array. You try to read from a file, but the file doesn't exist. You can't open the file. You can't establish a socket connection to the internet. You know, any number of things that you can't control. I can't control from here whether my file, whether you have that file on your computer or not. Yeah, through careful programming, I could solve this, right? I could do if y is equal to zero, then don't do that, right? But we're going to fix it. So when I run it, it's not giving me the exception, is it? Is it up here at the top? Yeah, java.lang.arithmetic exception. That's my error. Java.lang is included by default in every project, so when I catch my exception, I'm not going to need that whole data type. I can just use that. So what I need to do, and maybe you did this in Python, is put this in a try. Hey, computer, try this. But if it goes wrong, we need to catch the exception. Now, remember in Python, we had the accept keyword. We don't have that. We have catch... And then we have arithmetic exception. I just copied it from my error, but I could have typed it in. EX for exception. And if that happens, we're going to tell them that they have an error. Let's print the message out for that exception and see if it's clear enough. What, what we ought to do is print out our own error message instead. But system.out.println. EX dot get message, like that. And by the way, we better give z a good value, because when we get down here, we're not going to be able to print z. Right? Because if, it, if this failed, then z never got assigned. We never initialized it. We could initialize it up here. But it's a bad value, right? I mean, if we get this exception, it's not any good. So what we could conceivably do is just move this print statement up here, right? I took that print statement and I put it inside the try block. Why did I do that? Because I don't have a valid value for z if the division fails. Why don't we put a slightly better message here? Print line, what's it called if you do a division? Quotient? Quotient equals, end quote, comma, z. And is that not my syntax? Is it all pluses in this language? Yeah. Too much Python today. Okay, and so there was my error. Did you see what git message did? It coughed up a little bit of a, of a message.
but maybe not enough to show the user. So we might tell them system.out.println a runtime error occurred colon then we could print that out and then we might give them the result no result could be calculated now our program doesn't crash that's what exception handling is for it actually handles the error and if we ask for data from the user, we could just tell them to enter a new value, right? Doesn't blow up, we just say, you know, you have the denominator and the numerator, you know, give me a new denominator. Give me a new value to divide by. Now it's telling me I don't need this default value. And that's true enough because the only time I print it out is if this is successful. If we wanted to get all fancy and technical, we might set a flag, right? OK is equal to false. And if we get here, we set OK equal to true. And down here, when we want to use that volume, we check to see if we're OK. Not volume. If we want to use that value, we check to see if we're OK. But I'm just going for the purest, shortest example of an exception there. There are other errors. What's another error? What if we ask the user to give us a number and then we try to convert it to an int, but they typed in some bad data? So we're going to need a scanner for this one. Please tell me I've been recording the whole time. Good. All righty. So scanner sc is equal to new scanner system. I don't know why I'm making us do a scanner. Forget it. You know how to do scanners. So I'm leaving that off. So string s input is equal to 1.0. But this is invalid because we're going to try to turn it into an integer. Int i is equal to, like we got to parse it. Integer dot parse int, parentheses, in parentheses. And let's pass our s input into it. And I don't know. Print it out. System dot out dot print line value squared is equal to plus i times i. All right, looks great, but gonna blow up because this is not an integer. So when I run it, I'm gonna see another exception. Java.lang dot number format exception. That's my error. So this guy threw an exception. Parsent threw an exception. Now there are two kind of exceptions. Well, there are two broad categories. There's something called checked exceptions, and there's something called unchecked exceptions. Now that terminology is misleading. Checked means it sounds like you're checking it, and unchecked means it sounds like you didn't check it yet. Checked should be mandatory. The, the word should be mandatory. Mandatory exceptions and non-mandatory exceptions. Both arithmetic exception and number format exception are unchecked exceptions, meaning that they are not mandatory to handle. You can blow off handling it at the risk of your program crashing. Maybe you have another way of handling it, right? Maybe you check to see whether they're dividing by zero before we actually try that. Maybe we check to see if this is numeric input, because you know, there are ways of doing that. So maybe you didn't want to take the time to implement catching on it. However, there are checked exceptions, which are mandatory. File I.O. and Internet I.O. You have to catch those exceptions or else the code won't even work. All right. So, we got to fix this. We got to fix that error that we saw here. So, I need to enclose my code in some try catches. What's the code that can fail? This one. Now, really, I don't like putting declaring my variable inside the try block, but in this case, I'm gonna, I guess. But no, in, in real life, we would have asked the user for it beforehand. 
So I'm going to separate these two things. Int i, i is equal to integer dot percent. I'm going to try this stuff, right? But it can generate an exception. So if something goes wrong, number format exception. Ex. System dot out dot print line. I need a whole number only. Or we could, you know, give it a more formal type error message. System.out.println cannot print the square. Now that's stupid, right? Because you could certainly square a, a floating point number. But when it runs, All right, so we, ca we have captured two errors. A runtime error occurred, no result could be calculated. I need a whole number only, cannot print the square. You can put multiple catches. I'm gonna steal both of these catches here. I could just type them in again. But I'm gonna do something here. Don't know what. Try, you know, String s is equal to 0.0. Int result is equal to 1 divided by, well, let's parse it first. Integer i is equal to capital integer dot parse int, that string. And now let's try to divide. 1 by i. And this would really be much more satisfying to test if we really were using a scanner. So I'm going to go ahead and take the time to implement a scanner. Scanner se is equal to new scanner system.in system.out.println Please enter a number. Now that, okay, I am going to leave it as an integer because Java does something different if you divide by zero, if that zero is a floating point, and I really do want it to generate the exception. It doesn't generate an exception. Instead, it produces a strange value. All righty. It doesn't know what a scanner is, so I'm going to add the import for java.util.scanner. Integer.parsent, i is already defined. Okay, fine. Won't redefine it. Now it's complaining. Why? Because we have a try but no catches. We have two things that can generate exceptions now. This parsing and this division. I guess I better print out what that is. What is it called when you flip a number, 1 divided by x? The inverse. I believe so. Pardon me? I believe so. Okay. The inverse is plus result. Okay. So if everything goes great, we'll see that message. But there are problems. So we have to catch both things. Catch number format, capital N, capital F, exception EX. System dot out dot print line. I needed a whole number, sorry. And then we have to catch the other error. Catch. I forgot what it was, so I'm going to scroll up and look. Arithmet arithmetic exception. Okay. So down here. Arithmetic exception ex system dot out dot print line I can't divide by zero
All right. If this works, then if I enter good data, it'll print the inverse of it, good data being a whole integer. I never scanned for it. Okay. Before my parse int, I actually need to scan it. S is equal to scanner dot next. So I had to put that before parse int. And that means that this value is completely ignored, so it's giving me a warning that I could remove this equals 0, 0.0 there. I wish your compiler didn't do that, because, you know, I like saying string s is equal to empty quotes, but if you don't wind up using those empty quotes, it complains. Alrighty, so please enter a number. First, I'm going to test to see if it works. 10. Yeah, the inverse is 0. Now, why did it say that? <laughs> it said it because it did integer math. Okay, so how about 100 divided by i? And we're not going to call it the inverse. We're going to say the inverse times... Nah, we're going to say 100 divided by... is result. And since I'm calling it x here, I'm going to change my input message. Instead of please enter a number, I'm going to say please enter x. All right, please enter x, 10. 100 divided by x is 10. Very good. I'm going to enter some bad data, 10.0. I needed a whole number. Sorry. I'm going to run it again. Please enter X. I'm going to give it garbage data. Oh, I forgot. What I'm really trying to prove is that if I type in zero, it catches that error. I can't divide by zero. Okay, that's exception handling in a nutshell. The next thing we're going to do, we'll be using file I.O. And if you did file I.O. in basic Java, then this is not revolutionary stuff. But I figured that we needed to hit it again. All right, so this is our last bit of code. Can't fit it all on the page at the same time. Sorry. I can get close, though. If I put that opening quote there, opening brace there, and opening brace there, and put this opening brace here. You can actually chain exceptions. You can say, I want to catch multiple different types of exceptions in the same catch. And there's also a generic exception. You can just say catch exception without giving it a special exception because they're all inherited from the exception class. But if you do that, then any exception that it generates will be caught. If you specify what kind of exception, then if it generates another error that's not handled here, then it does crash. It does stop the program, but you find out, you know, exactly what went wrong. But if I just did catch exception, print error occurred, I would have no idea what went wrong. All I would know is that something went wrong. So generally you don't want to do catch exception. The cheaty way of doing it is to put try at the very beginning of your program and then catch at the very end of your program and then, well, it never crashed. Yeah, but if anything goes wrong, it, you know, it just prints out that error message. That's, a, that's as close to crashing as you can get. All right, let's make a Dropbox for him. Oh, something else I wanted to mention. The alternate interface assignment. Let me get the Dropbox created, then we'll talk about that. Four nineteen. We're creating homework in, or not homework, tutorial in.
All right, the more awesome version of the piggy bank. This also uses exceptions. No, not exceptions, interfaces. So let's take a look at it. Write a program that simulates a piggy bank. It'll ask the user for what type of coin to add and then tell the user how many, ask the user for how many and what type of coins to add, right? So that's slightly different in two ways, right? Our program didn't ask how many, how many dimes you wanted to add, and it didn't ask, all it did is ask for values, right? You type in point 0.10 or whatever. So the solutions should have the following classes, a piggy bank, a coin class, that's new, and a client class. So piggy bank should have an array list of coin objects. The piggy bank will need an add method that accepts a number, how many coins you're adding, and then the specific type of coin. So these are the coins, penny, nickel, dime, quarter, dollars. I ought to just make a singular, right? Penny, nickel, dime, quarter, dollar. And it will also need methods that show how many coins are in the bank, how much money is in the bank. If you've done the, uh, the other piggy bank assignment, you've already got that. And the class should not allow the user to put more than 50 coins in the bank. So I give a suggested UML for it. If the bank is full, return zero. Here's where it gets a little tricky. If the bank is not full before you add money to it, but becomes full while processing, you're only allowed to add the coins up until it's got 50 in it, right? Because if you try to insert 100 coins in it, it can only accept 50 of them and then return the number that were added. Otherwise, it should just return the exact method. In all cases, it should return how many coins were added. So for example, add coins 10 comma C. Say the bank already has 45 out of 50 coins. It will add five coins, filling the bank up, and return five, indicating that the five coins were added. So what has the bank got in it? It's got an array list of coins. And so if you add 10 coins to it, or five, it should loop, adding one, two, three, four, five coins of that type, or 10 coins of that type. So you're going to need a UML, excuse me, you're going to need a coin class. For some reason I say I'm going to give you a UML for it, and I don't. The design of the coin class is up to you. As long as piggy bank has the required methods and can return the number of coins and their total value and support values for the specified coin types, you get full credit. So basically your coin class is going to have what? Maybe a name of the coin and then a get value. Right, and so if you have a dime, it's supposed to return the value of 0.10, and if you have a nickel, it's supposed to return the value of 0.05. So the sample run. Enter how many coins are zero to quit. I'm going to enter five. What type of coin? One for pennies, two for dimes. One. Five pennies were added to the bank. The bank contains five coins worth five dollars, you know, 0.05 dollars. And we keep going. We try to add negative one. Nice try. You can only add positive numbers of coins and then we decide to quit. I also put a help document in here for the semesters that are internet only and I wind up with a lot of questions over the same question, you know, over the same thing, then I wind up making help documents. Really? Where's my other piggy bank document? I was just looking at it. Oh, come on. I must have two windows open. Trust me, there's a help document in it. I'm not going to go over it. You can eyeball it. If you have any questions, which one would I rather you do? You've already got all the framework in place to do the piggy bank. Maybe that one seems easier. On the other hand, you could probably do the uh, one with the tetrahedrons and the triangles in, in 20 minutes based on our example, if that. So, yes, sir? Uh, well, I have a question after class. Okay, okay, cool. So let's stop. Any more questions? Nope. All right. Oh, by the way, if you were looking at your grades and you see a zero there, it just means that you either haven't submitted something or I haven't graded it. It doesn't mean that it's too late and you can't turn it in.
and I accept late assignments anyways. So, you know, if you saw a zero on your exam, the due date for the exam is not passed. Okay.